My name is Effie Maybach, and I am a senior at Duke. And this past semester, I was a student in Professor Hoffman's Cybersecurity and National Security Law and Policy course. And today, I'll be presenting my capstone presentation titled Protecting Democracy, Addressing Foreign Social Media Algorithm Manipulation. I use social media every day, and I presume that's the same for many of you. And I typically do so in order to stay in touch with others, which was the initial purpose behind why social media was created. But it's clear to me, as I'm sure it's clear to many of you, that this initial reason is no longer the main reason. A lot of people use social media to read about the news, to understand what's going on in the world, and generally as a way to pass time. And while the shift isn't inherently bad, there are aspects of it that are. Specifically in terms of individuals taking advantage of social media algorithms in order to show users specific content. And what I'm particularly concerned about is this interference by foreign social media users. And so I'm seeking to address here the role that they are playing in interfering with American social media, the ways in which that is affecting American democracy and the opportunities that exist to mitigate this. But first, it's important to understand how the internet functions and how that's created these opportunities for interference by these foreign users. The internet is open platform, which means that anyone is able to contribute to it. Um, you don't need authentication in order to do so. And this creates this free flow of information because anyone can share their thoughts with anyone else. In the US, there's very few regulations over the internet because of First Amendment protections over speech, um, which creates, again, this free flow of information, but also information that doesn't necessarily have to be true because of the First Amendment protections. And so it's because of this functionality and the fact that social media sites function in the same way, that there's this vast opportunity for interference on social media, especially through targeting individuals through algorithm manipulation. And that's what's of particular interest to this presentation. And so it's clear that this open platform functionality isn't always a good thing. Russia and China in particular have taken advantage of this reality and have begun to exploit American social media sites in order to achieve various desires of theirs. And I'll walk through three case study examples right now. The first is Russian interference in the 2016 election in the United States. According to an article published in the Oklahoma Law Review in 2018, US intelligence agencies like the FBI and the CIA have concluded with high confidence that the Russians interfered in the 2016 election stating that Putin launched a campaign to undermine faith in American democracy in order to ultimately aid Trump's chances of winning. We now know that Russia employed bots, fake social media accounts, and trolls in order to spread false information about the election. Um, they promoted pro-Trump ideology, promoted false and inflammatory stories, and posts that attacked Clinton, and stories that played to hot button issues in order to create greater conflict among the American electorate. These Russian accounts reached 10 million people. Um, and they also hacked into the Democratic National Convention in order to release information and further shed the Democrats in a negative light. And so it's clear that they had a wide reach, but it's also clear that they had a vast impact with many believing that it was because of this operation that Trump was able to win the election. What's most frightening to me about this is that the entire operation cost only $100,000, which I know is a lot of money, but in the scheme of things, it's really not. And it goes to show that very little is needed to be spent in order to influence elections and in order to influence populations. Any nation could reasonably do the same. Um, completely disrupting democracy for a very, very small price. Russia also promoted anti-West sentiment on social media in Latin America. According to the New York Times, 
there's also evidence that Russia had interfered in these South American nations through social media like Twitter, specifically in Chile. And the photos on the slider of the protesters there in 2019, which again are believed to have been aided by the Russians on social media, who sought to stir up conflict in the nation, but also who sought to stir up conflict specifically between the citizens in those nations and the US. It's unclear how effective the campaign was in sparking unrest in Latin America, but it is clear that there was interference from Twitter accounts linked to Russia. The Spanish language arms of RT, formerly known as Russia Today, and Sputnik Mundo reached 18 million people in 10 different countries every week. And they've been accused of spreading disinformation, conspiracy theories, and various content that was designed to counter Western democracies as policies. And these accounts can all be tra traced back to the Internet Research Agency in Russia. Chilean President Sebastian Piñera noted that foreign actors aided the violent wave of protests and vandalism in the country in 2019. And while he didn't say which country was responsible, the rate of posts by Russia-linked Twitter accounts was 9% higher during the protests than it had been previously. And so it's clear that these Russian news sites were capitalizing on anti-American sentiment around the world, especially in Chile and other nations in Latin America, in order to create conflict there. And again, this goes to show the true extent of the influence that Russia has globally, um, specifically on social media. They have this immense amount of power and they can distort the news however they please. But it's not just Russia that's interfering on social media. Um, there have been various Chinese manipulation campaigns on American social media. According to the New York Times, China has aggressively used Facebook and Twitter to both promote pro-Chinese ideology as well as to influence American democracy and elections, very similarly to what Russia did. In 2021, the U.S. intelligence community determined that China had increased efforts to influence the U.S.'s political environment in order to shape policies, public discourse, and pressure figures who it views as anti-CCP in order to comply with policies that were beneficial to their nation. And so they're influencing the algorithm in order to quiet anti-China rhetoric and further portray themselves in a good light. And there's fear that the CCP will pressure Chinese-based social media sites like TikTok and WeChat, WeChat and find routes to do the same in Facebook in order to promote and suppress certain content that either is good for them or bad for them. And the main goals of these campaigns are to improve opinions of China right now, but they're obviously capable of doing more. Um, there's no evidence that they interfered in the 2020 election but leading up to the 2022 election, Facebook noted that China had begun to launch disinformation campaigns in order to promote pro-CCP ideology. And so they're laying the foundation for them to interfere on social media in the future, and it's reasonable to assume that they will. And so why does this matter? It feels like a simple question, and the answer is quite simple too. It matters because this behavior poses an imminent threat to democracy, both in the US and abroad. And it will continue to pose this threat unless it is aptly addressed through legislation. I've pulled together this timeline of important legislation that relates to this issue, but also important gaps within this legislation that I will build upon at the end when I present various recommendations for how to address um, this social media, this foreign social media interference. And so let's start with FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which was initially enacted in 1938. I read a dense report that was published in 2019 that covered the history of FARA and the way in which it has been used up until now. It was initially passed to counter Nazi propaganda that was proliferating throughout the US. And the paper noted that at the time of publication, FARA had never been used against foreign social media actors. This was in 2019. But it remains relevant for the desired policy recommendations because there is opportunity to use it. And in fact, it's been the subject of public, of public conversation somewhat recently, given that Robert Mueller, 
who was the former director to the FBI in the Trump administration, claimed that the Russians who interfered with American social media during the 2016 election violated FARA by failing to register as agents of a foreign nation, in this case, the Russian government. And so who were these actors? According to FARA, persons, individuals, associations, organizations who act as agents of a foreign principal must be registered as foreign agents if they act as an agent, representative, employee, or servant, or any person who acts in any other capacity at the order, request, or under the direction or control of a foreign principal. The Russians could have fallen under this if they were in fact directed by the Kremlin to interfere on American social media. There is of course the chance that they were not directed to do so. Um, but this in general shows that we need to better enforce this law in order to ensure that individuals who are in fact acting on behalf of their state identify themselves. I understand that this enforcement will be challenging, but I'll provide a way for it to be mandated um, when presenting my policy recommendations later on. The next piece of legislation is Section 230, which was added to the Communications Decency Act in 1996. According to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Section 230 states that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider, which essentially enables social media companies to become safe, safe havens for free speech. The clause rids social media companies of any responsibility for misinformation that is spread on their sites. And this allows these sites to remain protected despite enabling the proliferation of false information. And again, I'll present a policy recommendation that might help close this gap and prevent them from continuing to function as these safe havens if they don't take reasonable steps to prevent the spread of misinformation. The next piece of legislation that I'd like to discuss is Presidential Policy Directive 28 that President Obama implemented in spring 2014. He released this directive after Edward Snowden spoke out about the type of intelligence work conducted and the type of intelligence collected by the NSA. This directive acknowledges that the US has sought to gather intelligence throughout the country's history in order to safeguard national security and that the country does in fact conduct signals intelligence. But the directive recognizes that other nations do too. And it notes that the collection of this information is often necessary in order to promote and advance national security. This is particularly important to the issue of foreign interference on social media because it provides necessary information to better understand why the US should be concerned about interference and how they can respond to interference with American democracy through data collection on the very actors who are interfering with social media. Collecting this type of information to safeguard national security is necessary, but it's also legal. And it represents a significant step taken by the US to try to establish a global norm that nations can, can't use foreign intelligence collection capabilities to violate individual civil, civil liberties, with the understanding that the US won't do so either. Now, the final piece of legislation that I'd like to discuss is the Honest Ads Act, which was introduced by Senator Amy Klobuchar in 2019 in order to address the quickly increasing level of interference in the digital political ad space. The bill is designed to provide limitations and requirements regarding political advertising, with the supposed goal being to prevent foreign actors from interfering in the American democratic process. The bill requires that platforms ensure that political advertising is not purchased by a foreign national, not just foreign actors. And so it distinguishes between these and makes it a little bit broader in that no other individuals from foreign countries can interfere within American elections. The bill didn't gain traction, unfortunately, um, but it represents a step in the right direction regarding how to mitigate foreign interference in American elections. 
and other states have sought to implement similar limitations in order to further protect elections from outside influence. But as I've alluded to before, these policies are not enough. And I'll walk through a few different hypothetical situations that might occur if loopholes within legislation are not addressed. And so the first hypothetical deals with Chinese influence in the 2024 election here in the US. Imagine a situation in which China interferes with the algorithm on social media. They promote anti-immigrant sentiment to the right and pro-immigrant sentiment to the left to further polarize the American electorate. And this leads to two extremist candidates winning the Democrat and Republican primaries, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, um, which means that moderates in the US are left without a candidate who they believe adequately represents their beliefs. And Americans increasingly lose faith in the US political process because the electorate has become single issue voters on immigration and the moderates feel like they don't have a party that adequately represents them, leading to great debate about the direction of the country and the country's values, all because of Chinese influence. The second hypothetical is also related to China, um, but specifically Chinese influence in Latin America. China has built up an increasingly strong economic connection with Latin American countries, and there is an incentive for them to continue to improve this relationship and consequently worsen those countries' views of the US. They can do so by harming their democracies, especially in light of the fact that leaders of less democratic, often authoritarian governments are looking for a partner that would support that role, and China will. And so imagine a situation where Chinese-backed Twitter and Facebook accounts promote pro-democratic sentiment and thus anti-Maduro posts in order to create conflict in Venezuela. They prompt mass protests and thus mass government crackdown campaigns on the people, which encourages another coalition of Venezuelans to flee to the U.S., creating border crises that the U.S. government now has to handle. It's very similar to what happened um, in 2018 with the Russian interference in these countries and that they were believed to have sparked the vast migrant campaign. Venezuela is already facing mass human rights troubles, so social media interference could be the catalyst that sparks greater controversy and leads to more protests in the country. The whole goal behind these Chinese interference campaigns would be to destabilize the Western world and to create greater troubles for the US, disrupting democratic rule in this hemisphere. And so not only would this interference disrupt American democracy, but it would disrupt democracy within these countries too. And so it's in the US government's best interest to address this issue, both to preserve American democracy, but also democracy around the world. My classmate Riley Hicks developed and shared a survey that garnered 76 responses. And it was designed to grant her a better understanding of how her peers view social media and what understanding, if any, they have regarding the role foreign actors play online. And her findings shed more light on the importance of this topic, as well as how the US government can best address this issue. And so what she found was that 89% of respondents use social media apps multiple times a day. TikTok is overwhelmingly not used because of privacy concerns and 53% report receiving news about current events on social media. And social media is clearly used a lot, but it's also clear that there is concern about certain apps and the type of influence that those apps have over the information that people receive. And so how can we best address this? I have three recommendations. The first is to revise Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. There has been support to do so in the past from various congressional representatives, and there's great opportunity to do so now. The second recommendation is to note which social media accounts are tied to foreign actors or are based outside the country in which the content is being shared in, so that individuals are not blindly following information that is being posted online. And the third recommendation 
is that the NSA should hire more Spanish speaking intelligence analysts in order to further protect democracy in those nations and to increase the focus on the types of misinformation that is being spread on social media sites in those countries. So my first recommendation states that we need to include a clause in the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, that makes the lack of responsibility for content shared online contingent on reasonable attempts to prevent misinformation from spreading, which could include greater scrutiny over all types of content shared in order to prevent misuse of the social media site. If content is shared promoting an insurrection or calling for an election to be overturned, for example, Facebook must be responsible for carefully reviewing and removing that content. They say that they do, but there is clearly still room for improvement because misinformation continues to rapidly spread. Even Mark Zuckerberg admitted to Congress that it would make sense for platforms to be liable for some of the content that is shared on their sites. President Joe Biden and Senator Lindsey Graham have also called for updates to Section 230. And Texas courts are already beginning to hold social media platforms liable, such as Facebook for sex trafficking posts. And thus codifying this change is not an entirely new or novel idea. And although some individuals argue that there is no need to update Section 230, believing that it allows for greater innovation, the reality is that real harm is occurring. To add some context to the desire for and necessity of this recommendation, according to Riley's data, the majority of respondents are not concerned about a violation of the First Amendment if social media companies are obligated to take down content from foreign actors, which indicates that there is general concern about the type of content and thus the type of influence that foreign actors are currently having on social media. Critics, however, are in indeed expected to challenge this on the basis of violating the First Amendment. And so this change to Section 230 will need to be drafted with care and will need to include stakeholders in the process in order to pass judicial scrutiny. My second recommendation is that we must note when social media accounts are connected to foreign actors or are based outside the country that the app is being used in, in order to prevent the blind spread of content from abroad. The majority of respondents in Riley's survey are aware of foreign nation states' presence on social media apps, believe that these social media sites should prevent these foreign users from using these apps, and report wanting stricter regulations over the type of content that is posted on social media. Foreign actors, according to FARA's definition, and foreign nationals must be identified on social media sites. I foresee their social media accounts being designated as such. And so if individuals are accessing Facebook from within the US, for example, but someone in Russia is sharing content, that Russian's social media handle in which they are sharing the content under will be tagged as an account that is not physically located within American borders. And so all there, there will be loopholes ar around this, such as if someone uses a VPN, the recommendation should be effective in at least addressing some of the issues stemming from outside influence, or at least making it a bit more difficult to bypass the rules in place. Again, we would need to partner with social media companies directly to achieve, to achieve this through some sort of geographical tagging. Additionally, foreign actors, so the individuals who are acting on behalf of the state per the definition in FARA, should also be more rigorously tracked to ensure that they are also identifying themselves to the US government and that their accounts are also including that designation that notes that they are in fact foreign actors. And again, we would have to partner with the social media companies and the US government in order to achieve this, but it should be possible by using signals intelligence under the Presidential Policy Directive 28. These intelligence data collection practices will create liability for the platforms and will open the door for stricter regulation over content shared by foreign nationals, which is in line with the recommendations for improvements to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And so these two recommendations would act in partnership. This designation is also similar to Amy Klobuchar's Honest Ads Act and that it seeks to mitigate the amount of influence that foreign nationals have online by identifying them and is therefore not entirely unfeasible. 
unfeasible. My third recommendation is that the NSA should direct more resources to addressing foreign influence on social media in Latin America, including hiring more Spanish speaking analysts and working with governments to bolster democracy. The US needs to expand focus into Latin America in order to protect democracy there, but also to protect democracy in the United States. The NSA specifically hires language analysts to provide an intimate view into various signals intelligence and is traditionally considered Arabic, Chinese, Farsi, and Russian to be critical languages for national security needs, thereby prioritizing hiring individuals who speak those. And while it would be unfair to say that hiring Spanish speaking analysts hasn't been of prime concern, there remains ample opportunity to expand focus into Latin America. Social media companies have traditionally not been as concerned with preventing the spread of it, misinformation there because many of these companies are based in the US and therefore under scrutiny from the American government and the American public. And so the recommendation here is that the US shift scrutiny to Latin America in order to safeguard international political order and to protect global governance and democracy. Russia recognizes the fragility of many of the democracies there and has previously played into that instability such as when instigating the migrant caravan a few years back via social media algorithm manipulation. And so it's important that the US and specifically the NSA directs their focus to misinformation spreading on social media apps within Latin American nations, because that will encourage social media companies to do the same, further preventing the destruction of global democracy. My goal today was to discuss how we can further protect American democracy, specifically as it relates to foreign interference on American social media accounts, but also as it relates to interference within Latin American social media accounts to protect democracy there as well. It's clear that foreign actors are demo disrupting democracy through these platforms. Russia is doing so, China has done so, and because of the low barriers to entry, given how cheap it is to interfere and conduct disinformation campaigns, it's reasonable to assume that other nations will begin to do the same as well. And so we need to begin to address existing loopholes within legislation, as I sought to do through the recommendations that I introduced, in order to further protect democracy and prevent this from happening again. The US government, therefore, has a vested interest in addressing the interference because democracy is at stake, both domestically and internationally, as we saw in Latin America. And finally, I identified three key policy opportunities that exist that could generate meaningful change. The first was to revise Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. There have been previous efforts to do so, and by making the safe haven status that many of the social media companies enjoy right now, conditional on reasonable attempts to prevent misinformation from spreading, I think we could further incentivize these companies to really more stringently censor the types of content that is being posted. I also recommended that foreign actors, according to FARA's definition and, fair and foreign nationals, be identified on social media so that individuals who are using these platforms are aware that they are consuming content from individuals not physically located within their nation. Um, that'll at least draw some scrutiny to the types of content that individuals are consuming and may prevent the spread of misinformation. And finally, I recommended that the NSA hire more Spanish speaking agents and generally increase funding to Latin America to increase scrutiny over social media and further regulate social media there in order to prevent the spread of misinformation. We've seen that misinformation has been spreading within these Latin American countries and that that has disrupted democracy in those nations. And if the NSA increases their scrutiny in those countries regarding social media use there, these social media companies will do the same and that could further help protect democracy. Thank you.